is my child autistic with demand avoidance or is my child PDA autistic? This is a great question. It's one I get a lot from parents. And as part of the Clarity Workshop series with parents interested in enrolling in the Paradigm Shift program, I'm going to provide a free training on this topic. So again, the question is, is my child autistic with demand avoidance or is my child 14 PDA autistic? So we're gonna talk about six things pertaining to this question. Hi everybody, it's good to see you. We're gonna talk about the lens through which we view our children and the root cause of behaviors, that's one. Two, we're gonna talk about the fact that things are not always binary. We're gonna talk about patterns I've observed among the hundreds of PDA children and teens with, who's, with whom families I've worked with. Then I'm gonna talk about patterns among the parents themselves that I've observed with the hundreds of parents that I've worked with. Then we're gonna talk about why an experimental approach is necessary and useful as a parent for PDA children and teens. And then we will wrap up with a Q&A for you guys, which is going to be focused on two things, clarity around this question and specific questions about the Paradigm Shift program to help you determine if that's the right next step for your family, which will be opening, enrollment will be opening for the wait list on Wednesday, Wednesday, August 9th. Okay, so let's get started. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with a story about my own son to help you guys get clarity on the concept of a lens and a root cause. Okay, hi everybody. <laughs> so. When my son was in burnout and when we had just moved to Michigan from Washington DC, I was incredibly, incredibly confused as a parent. And I was very frustrated by this because I had done all my Excel spreadsheets. I had done what I thought I needed to do with the research. I was leveraging all my doctoral level training to try and read the peer review articles on all the different things like sensory, autism, conduct disorder, all the things, which I had done early in his life as well when he was an infant. I spent lots of time reading about colic and prevalence and all that. And when I moved to Michigan, I was still ultimately very confused. And I'll give you a scenario to illustrate this. So in the mornings to go to his daycare, which he seemed to enjoy when he was there, although, hi everybody, he was masking at the time, which I didn't understand. Um, I was employing all of these supports that at their root had a different root cause as the logic. Okay, so for example, I was interpreting the fact that when it was time to go to school, he was running from me, hiding under chairs, he was climbing on the backs of couches, he would run from me inside of our car, he would unbuckle himself, he would refuse to put his shoes on, he would run up the stairs, <laughs> hide under the bed, um, go on windowsills, try and get out the front door. Okay, so definite flight response, but I was not viewing it through that lens. What I was viewing it as was behavioral, social communication issue, executive functioning differences, and sensory differences. Okay, because those are often the first lenses that professionals give us or that the literature delivers to us, right? So what was I doing to support my child through this lens? So first, through the sensory lens, I was trying to think through, okay, the root cause is that he doesn't like the tags on his shirts. He doesn't like, you know, the seams on his underwear or his um, socks. So I need to accommodate that so that there's no resistance. Okay, so that was the sensory lens. The other thing I was doing at the request of many therapists and well-meaning practitioners was I was doing a lot of autism supports, more traditional autism supports. So I had developed all of these beautiful laminated pictures that I could move around. I had the first then statements. I had the charts to try and walk him through the difficult transition. The underlying assumption of the root cause then in his resistance was based on the logic of non-PDA autism, which is 
social communication differences. Like I need to communicate with him differently so he understands the steps to get out the door. And rigidity around transitions. So these were the tools. Okay, it doesn't mean they're wrong by any means, but the lenses through which I was looking at things were like this. First social communication, then sensory, and there was nothing about autonomy or nervous system. Okay, so for many of you who have, and it wasn't working, obviously. <laughs> it was not working at all. It was escalating things because the root cause was actually his perception of me trying to make him walk through these supports of like, okay, now it's time to do the laminated chart. What does this part of his brain perceive, the limbic system? It's perceiving, oh my gosh, I'm in danger, my body's gonna die, and the nervous system goes off and he goes into flight, which is why he's on the back of couches and hiding under the bed. If we look at it through a different lens of defiance, that's a different root cause, okay? What was actually happening was that, but I didn't know that, okay? And this is not to say that social communication and sensory are not important to help my son. They are. These are dimensions of his brain wiring. But what I teach parents, and I hope will be helpful to you, whether or not you join the program, is that we have to switch the lens prioritization, okay? So like if your child has been diagnosed with autism and you don't know if the resistance is based on sensory or social communication, often you have this question because what you're doing isn't really working, right? And so what we can do is we can flip the lens and think through, okay, what if I put autonomy first, the perception of autonomy and equality first, and look at everything through that lens first, and then below that we have sensory experience and social communication, which will fluctuate those needs depending on how activated the nervous system is, okay? And so through that different lens, we're no longer focusing on the solutions being laminated charts, first then statements, strict routines, sensory accommodations, etc. Those are accommodations that may work if the child has a regulated nervous system, but the feature of PDA autistic children is that that first lens will override all other lenses, okay? So the first thing we want to do as we're trying to answer these questions as parents is take our autonomy and equality lenses and always put them on first, okay? So the question I would reflect back to you is, does it help to understand your particular child through this lens? Does their behavior make more sense? If we're first looking at the question, is their limbic system interpreting and perceiving a loss of autonomy or equality to you, sometimes through the application of the tools that are meant to help autism or social communication, which is often perceived as one and the same, does it help you gain clarity on the deep why and what might help your child to think through this different lens? And if the answer is yes, then that is your first tiny step towards more clarity on potentially your child being PDA, okay? I hope this is resonating for you guys. The second is um, that it's not binary, Okay, and I want to use another story to illustrate this with my other son, William. So I have two sons. My PDA son, Cooper, is eight and a half, going on nine, and William is four and a half. And William is, I do not know what his neurotype is. <laughs> There's lots of variables going on. He has grown up in a PDA home at, with an externalized threat response, so he has anxiety and some trauma responses sometimes, but he also has his own experiences, right? He has his sensory differences that are very obvious and these play out in lots of different ways. However, and he does have a strong drive for autonomy. However, his drive for autonomy does not override all of his other survival instincts. How do I know this? Because I've collected the data in my own home, which is like the whole purpose of this page and my programs, etc., is to like empower you to see what's right in front of you. The example is from last night. Last night, my younger son, William, does not like to wash his hair. It's a difficult sensory experience. It's been like this since he was a baby. 
but his trajectory with this basic need has been very different. Expo like very gentle exposure therapy with like starting to do baths in a, a basin in the kitchen with like toys and just starting to have him touch it and stuff like that gradual exposure approach worked with him right he finally started bathing with a pda child even slight exposure if they're perceiving threat will actually put them into a trauma response so that's a difference right with my son last night william I pushed him through his own dysregulation because he needed to get his he needed to get his hair washed, right? He washes it once a week. This is not something I like to do, but I know that the cost to his nervous system, even though he has avoidance and a, and, and a strong drive for autonomy, is not going to causally link to him not sleeping, eating, um, toileting anymore, having regressions, like he gets activated, but then he comes down and it doesn't accumulate in his system. And so I'm not saying William is autistic, but because I don't know his neurotype, I'm just using a lot of the same approaches. But the difference between those moments of like, if I push my PDA son, this will eventually have a causal link to him accessing eating his metabolism because it will activate his nervous system. Um, he'll have diarrhea. He will not be able to sleep and all of these things. Okay. So there's a difference between avoidance and a strong drive for autonomy, which many autistic children have. I think many neurodivergent children have. And the question of whether this will systematically override other survival instincts like eating like toileting independently, like sleeping, either in the moment or in accumulation. So that's an illustration to show you that it's not binary, right? Like if your child has demand avoidance and your child has a strong drive for autonomy, the accommodations are going to help them. But your cost benefit decision making is going to be a little bit different, right? As a parent, for me, the cost of like, gently pushing my my younger son through washing his hair was worth the benefit of getting through it and us repairing afterwards and getting up to go to bed so he could sleep it was fine right it was, obviously activates my nervous system but the cost wasn't we're rupturing trust completely i'm setting off a survival response in his body and now he won't be able to sleep tonight or next week right so there's that subtle difference it's not binary and while the accommodations, the 12 most effective accommodations, I think can be helpful for any child, <laughs> I would say the cost benefit decision making as a parent is slightly different for a PDA child versus a non PDA child, autistic or not, which is fine. It's just the programs I design and the, and the workshops and everything are designed specifically for the cost benefit that parents of PDA children and teens are facing, which really is that causal link between cumulative nervous system activation and the disabling nature of the neurotype. Okay, so let's get down to some more specifics. So what are some patterns that we can look for among children and or teens who were not sure if they're non-PDA autistic with demand avoidance or PDA autistic. Okay, so that first thing I mentioned was that survival drive for autonomy of in accumulation over time, is your child constantly activating and his nervous system accumulate nervous system activation accumulating to the point where it's disabling, right? So if you're if you've put your child, there are three things that I see that cause burnout in the population of PDA kids and teens, which is like really strict behavioral parenting, really <laughs> unaccommodated school environments and behavioral approaches to therapy like ABA. Okay, so this seems kind of common sense, but if those approaches have actually helped your child, then they're not PDA. <laughs> Potentially, and we need to be discerning as parents because they may be internalizing and masking the the threat response that they're perceiving or they're feeling as a PDA, or and then it will come out in their basic needs. Okay, so we want to be really clear-eyed as parents of like, 
is it masking or when I employ more behavioral approaches to parenting, it actually makes things better. I imagine if you're here, that's not the case, okay? So there's that first survival drive for autonomy, but we have to trust our own data, okay? Like, I'm never gonna tell a parent that the data that they're observing in their own home and their intuition is wrong. And I'm also not gonna say that even if the approach is different than mine, right? This isn't philosophical. Um, this is like a science-based approach to supporting these children's nervous systems. Okay, the second thing is, what overrides what with your child? Does routine override novelty or novelty override new routine? And this is, again, not a binary question because a lot of, like my son needs the rhythms of certain routines, but then he will drop them because they, even if he decides on them, it will become an internal demand or an internally perceived loss of autonomy. So what you might see is there's a routine that's going consistently. They might have consented to it or even come up with it themselves, but then they drop it, right? So I'll give you another example with my two sons. When my younger, my older son, who's PDA, when I'd read him books, I had to read three books every night and I had to three, sing three songs. So there was a rhythm and a routine. But within that, I had to make up new words to all the songs and all the books and had to change them and engage with novelty or my son would reject everything and become dysregulated versus my more linear thinking, more rigid younger son who like literally wants to read the same book every night no matter what, in the same order, the same pages, etc. Okay? The next thing is with special interests, you see the same thing reflected, which is you know, you might have a couple continuing interests that are consistent throughout the child or teen's life or iterations of them. But with a PDA, or you might see an intense focus on one thing and then dropping it all together and then going to the next thing and dropping it all together. So like, first it's Pokemon, then it's Minecraft, then it's Beyblades, and then you buy all the things for Pokemon and then they never wanna see it again. The same is true for eating, right? And this is why we joke that like <laughs> parents and PDAers can't buy in bulk because as soon as you do, they're like, we're done now, right? Because it becomes a demand or a perception of a loss of autonomy or equality, okay? So from my perspective, this is a unique aspect of a PDA autistic brain where the need for novelty and the survival drive for autonomy is overriding the other autistic need for routine and, and similarity and, pre and predictability, okay? It doesn't mean they're in contrast to one another. We're just looking at which is prioritized and which lens we're looking through, okay? So the next one is directly from the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the fifth edition, which is what practitioners here in the United States and often abroad use to diagnose autism. So one of the two main features is restrict, restricted and repetitive interests. So this is what I sort of meant by special interests or monotropic focus, if we wanna use a more accurate language. So often when we think of this, we're like, well, A, my kid, changes things all the time, so it's not really restricted and repetitive, but also like they're not that into trains or they're not into collecting things or objects. They might be, but when we look at it through the lens of the fact that restricted and repetitive interests can be social in nature and often are for PDAers, then we realize actually there is a restricted and repetitive interest because maybe it's a character from a show, maybe it's a role or an animal or a person, a friend, an individual, a therapist, right? So often what you see is a restricted or repetitive interest in a particular child, another child, right? Where they're like, okay, I'm going to go to school because this one kid is there and they're my focus or my fixed interest. But if we look at this through an older conceptualization, more traditional conceptualization of autism, we're never going to notice that because the conventional wisdom on autism, which is outdated, is like they're not, there's no social interest, which is 
inaccurate as we know. Okay, but that's, I hope that tidbit is also helpful for all of you who are trying to get an autism diagnosis and may know your kid is PDA because you can frame social interests that you observe that are more restricted and repetitive as this, as, as fitting into the DSM-5 because we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot even if structures and systems and institutions aren't designed for us. Okay, and then the last one, which I will have an asterisk about, but I think it's very helpful. Again, these are non-scientific, but very simplified things that I have found help parents discern is, is the child able to play independently or not? And often parents who have autistic children, like the child will engage in their own interests and toys on their own, whereas especially when a PDA child has a lot of cumulative nervous system activation, often in the time that you're considering it, they can't do anything without you by their side because of that lack of nervous system safety. It all relates back to the nervous system, both needing, like the perception of a loss of autonomy and equality, which makes you think, oh, they need independence, but then you give it to them and they won't do anything for themselves. That's because they need those signals of nervous system safety at the root of this neurotype, okay? A ca the caveat is, is that internalized expressions of PDAers often in their childhood were able to play more independently. And of course we need to speak with, and I have with the families that I work with in the privacy or coaching containers and programs that they felt the intern, as children, felt the internalized activation and may have equalized against self, but nobody saw that they were in distress because they were internalizing that activation. So it appeared that they could play independently. So those are the patterns that you see in children and teens, just to like help you as a parent answer this question. And then here are the, pa the patterns among parents that I see, which I hope will also get you clarity on this question, which I'm just gonna remind everyone the question is, is my child autistic with demand avoidance or PDA autistic? Okay, so the patterns I've witnessed among parents, but also experienced myself are the following. Um, first, feeling completely alone, even in autistic spaces. <laughs> so I'll give you an example. Um, one of my son's stickiest basic needs is eating. His cumulative nervous system activation from constantly perceiving threat builds in his system and disables him from eating. Okay. That's his causal mechanism as a PDA child. However, when I went to support groups for, for parents of autistic children who also struggled to eat, I felt completely out of place, okay? And th this might not be C PC, but I'm just going to tell you what I was thinking. I was like, all these kids, even if they can't, you know, they're non-speaking or maybe have less so social communication capacity as my son, they're all much more regulated than my son and are playing independently while the parents are in this support group where like there's no way on God's green earth I could have brought him, right? Because he would have just been constantly interrupting me and totally dysregulated to the point that we're having panic attacks. Okay, so I first was like, okay, I'm in the wrong place here. Also, because everyone's talking about going through the same program at the university which is totally behaviorally based and, and got their child from a feeding tube to now eating all these foods that my son totally rejects and can't. And I was like, okay, what is happening? Like I, my, my son is autistic. He has sensory issues and he struggles to eat, but I feel completely out of place. Like we're not having the same experience. And so this is also very common for parents of PDAers. And from my experience working with parents who are PDA identifying, it's also an experience they might have in the autistic community, right? Because it's like a different experience <laughs> um, as adults. So this sort of taps into the second part of it, which is like nobody under seems to understand you, right? Like so most of the time parents of PDA children feel this deep sense of isolation, of being gaslit, and nobody understands how to help them. 
And often, not always, parents who have children who are more typically presenting autistic fit into a category that medical systems, therapy systems, educational systems understand, okay? So there's not, it's not to discount the difficulty of raising a child with high needs or neurodiver neurodivergent challenges. It is just to say it is a different degree of isolation and lack of understanding that parents of PDA children and teens experience, okay? And this is like my data from parents. <laughs> And it's a biased sample, but it's a large end sample, okay? So two more things. The third thing that parents won't admit or post on social media, but I've heard so many times and I've thought myself that I'm gonna share with you. If you are thinking to yourself secretly that you wish your child was more typically autistic because then people would understand how to help you and the tools would work, potentially your child is PDA <laughs> because I've had that thought. Many parents have had that thought and, and at its root, it's just like you want someone to understand you and your child. And like often when there's a more typical presentation or expression of autism, people understand it, right? They're like, oh, social communication dif difficulties. Like, yes, we, we have the tools at the school to deal with this, but it's a totally different root cause for what's disabling your child. And again, it's not binary. You can have two things going on at once, but this is generally a pattern I've noticed. And then finally, for the question, is my child autistic with demand avoidance or PDA autistic? The question would be, is a behavioral approach working for you, right? And this doesn't necessarily answer the question of like neurotype, but I tend to think of things in causal mechanisms rather than labels, even though I do care about getting PDA into the next DSM or some DSM, which is why I'm doing research with the University of Michigan. But like in terms of helping parents, what matters is what helps your family. What matters is what helps your child be well, right? So if behavioral approaches are working, quote, in terms of compliance, but you see that your child's nervous system activation or that they're constantly in fight, flight, freeze when they're around safe people and not at ABA or school or grandparents or therapists, they're completely in fight, flight, freeze, then it actually isn't working, right? Long term, what's happening is that they're moving towards burnout, just being honest. Second, if you're losing your connection with them, it doesn't matter if they're complying with like, you know, whatever they're being trained to do because ultimately connection and trust is your long-term currency that will change your child's life and your life with a PDA child. And then third, and this is super important, you might think that your child's medical issues like encapresis or, you know, reflex anoxic seizures or, you know, severe digestive issues or their non 24 hour sleep cycle or their toileting regression when they're seven, that they have to go in the bathtub or use a diaper after they've been potty trained. Like that is not separate from what they're doing in a behavioral or compliance based setting. It's easy to silo them because you're like, well, that's a medical issue and they're compliant <laughs> in these therapies. But what's actually happening is they're internalizing the threat response and that is activating the nervous system and accumulating to the point where it's causing it to impact basic needs. And this is the causality that is so important to understand and it, in my opinion is at the root of what makes this a nervous system disability and not a behavioral issue, okay? And this is true for adults as well. It's not just kids and they don't grow out of it. Okay, so finally, before we get to the Q&A, sometimes we don't know, okay? Sometimes we don't know what our child's neurotype is. And frankly, the categories were developed by humans who are imperfect and they don't necessarily capture all the nuance. And so what we really wanna do is approach our children objectively and with an experimental mindset which also will help with self-compassion for yourself, which just means 
develop a hypothesis, okay? So like if you're here and you're you're wondering, is my child non pda autistic or PDA autistic? And you work through all the conventional lenses, behavioral, social communication support, sensory, all the things, and your child doesn't seem to be thriving, then it's an opportunity to develop or test a new hypothesis, which is like, let's try on the autonomy, equality, and nervous system lens. And then we want to consistently practice accommodations designed around that root cause and collect data, right? And we want to do it consistently with support. We want to be objective and collect data and determine after a longer time horizon and consistency, oh, actually, my kid's doing better, right? They might not be complying, but their basic needs are better, their connection with me is better, and their fight, flight, or meltdowns has dramatically decreased, the violence has decreased, and you're seeing it come down. This is a long-term approach. The opportunity for you to do this, you can absolutely DIY it. I design all of my free stuff, so like if you're if you're someone who can't afford the programs, like, please just use all the free materials and like, you can do this without me, okay? But if you want and can afford a supportive community and that consistency to try a different lens and see objectively like, okay, this is what it looks like when we prioritize this other lens. And then you can see clearly, oh, okay, we saw all these behaviors improve, we saw these basic needs improve, but actually it looks like they still have really severe anxiety. And maybe with a developmental pediatrician, we should address that. But when everything's mixed together, you don't know what's going on. And so sometimes we have to take the action to try another way, okay? And I wanna invite you guys into the Paradigm Shift program with me for the next cohort. It will be transformative for your family if you take action. So this is not a good idea to commit to at this point in your journey if you are not able to implement, okay? It's not a support group, but there will be support. There will be nervous system support and coaches in the community, and I will be there to support you as well. Okay, so that being said, now... We have some time for Q&A, and I am going to prioritize those questions that have to do with the topic, which is, is my child autistic with demand avoidance or PDA autistic? And I'm happy to help you get more clarity or questions about the Paradigm Shift program itself, because this live is part of my launch, and I'll be doing a series of these leading up to Wednesday, a week from today, which is when you can enroll. Okay. I'm just going back to all, all the way to the beginning, but I imagine that some of the people who ask questions dropped off. Can I join a workshop from the UK? Absolutely. Yes. Everything's recorded and put into your online learning portal always. And you have lifetime access. And the teaching modules are pre-recorded and chunked out into 10 minute conceptual videos so that you can like go at your own pace. But the Q&As are live with me. Okay. Let's see. Hands comb Britallic. I don't know if I said your name right, but I'm not sure this is associated with the PSP, the Paradigm Shift Program, but I'm really struggling to accommodate enough to bring my son out of burnout as I find he gets into dangerous situations and I have to step in. Okay. So that to me is like a question it's a big question i like to chunk down questions it sounds like like the f one thing i would say hopefully that's needle moving to you is like again it's not binary of like you have to accommodate everything lower every demand and never say no it's about thinking about everything over a long-term period in accumulation so like if you're accommodating nine times out of ten your child's nervous system accumulation is gonna be good. Like you're gonna be doing everything you can. We have to th also think about the structure of their lives because if you're doing all the accommodation at home but they're in other scenarios like school where they're not ac accommodated, they're gonna be moving towards their threshold. Which is when you see 
the behaviors that don't see ra seem rational, the fight flight behaviors, etc. So like we want to think about it in accumulation in a holistic way, not in a perfectionist, I need to apply every accommodation to fix this. Right. And there is an energetic difference between those two. So we're going to be focused on in the paradigm shift program, always thinking through that lens of accommodate, like accumulation. You're always activating or accommodating your child's nervous system. That doesn't mean you can't say no, but how to think through that cost benefit framework, which is what we cover in the second module. And we'll actually spend two full weeks on actually implementing and applying that framework. So you'll have like the teaching module. And then you'll also have two two hour lives with me where we're gonna actually like apply the framework with parents real life situations. Sounds like your child is a teen just from your question. Yeah, keeps him safe but then goes into fight or flight. So it's a cost benefit decision making framework question. Um, and, and so there isn't like a right answer. It's put into the context of your family and your situation which we can get deeper into if you're in a more long-term program. Not me listening to your podcast, then signing on Instagram and seeing you are here live. <laughs> well, hello, Amy, Lizzie. It's nice to see you. I'm going to turn this one into a podcast too. So well said. I'm glad to hear. I relate about the books and novelty from my PDA. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I, would be, I used to work in like a corporate environment in downtown Washington, D.C., and like at 9 p.m. coming up with new iterations of like these children's books and like making them silly and changing the words and like reading from the front to the back like I my brain was like melting on my head by the end of every weekday okay how do I access access these live videos later so there's three ways one it's going to be here on Instagram so catch it here Two, it is going to be turned into a podcast, so you can pop me into your earbuds and have more autonomy away from screens. And then third, if you are signed up for the wait list, because this is part of my launch, but everyone is welcome. Um, if you're on my wait list, list then we're going to send you um, a link to the YouTube video and the podcast so you have easy access. Yeah, and you'll have updates about like the times for the rest of the Clarity series. Okay, let's see. Oh, I'm so glad that you feel validated. This point just made me cry. It's 100% how, how I feel. Yes, I mean, saying the things that all of us feel. <laughs> You're not crazy. Yeah, I felt crazy too. ABA brought out my son's fight. Yeah, I mean, in some ways that's lucky because then you can see clearly the externalized threat response. It can sometimes be more difficult for the parental journey to have an internalized threat response because you don't know that it's going off. And so I often see these um, families with like tweens and teens who hit that burnout kind of out of nowhere because in the moment the child was not reactive right yeah I feel so alone and out of place and not supported I've reached I've reached out to so many therapists that are PD affirming and they are full oh I'm so sorry well stick around here um you know the paradigm shift program is gonna have a community of other like-minded parents I know that that has been life affirming for many of the participants in past cohorts it is something that we're working to have in the alumni portal, which like after the three months, you go into the alumni portal and then you have a community that you can continue to connect with. So that is something that I hope to bring to my live programs because for me, it's also been so transformative to just be witnessed and be supported by other families at a similar stage in your journey. Um, I might also look at trauma-informed therapists or DIR floor time therapists, some occupational therapists that are neurodiversity affirming, even if they're not PDA specialists, they can be much more focused on like, again, the root cause of like, 
sensitive threat response. Doesn't matter what the neurotype is. Like, let's figure out a way to support your family. So that's just a tidbit to think about, a little problem solving. Um, the free materials have been so amazing. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I've never felt so seen and like, yes, someone gets everything that I could ever, never adequately explain to others. You could, you're just tired. <laughs> because believe me, believe me, I could not have articulated, written, done reels or anything on this like five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. Because my executive functioning like didn't work. Um, is it autism versus avoid? with avoidance versus PDA. Okay, so mum to levy, that is what this whole free training is about. So I encourage you to catch the replay. Whoops. Can you speak to your experience with toddlers and PDA versus non-PDA autism? So, I mean, I would, I am not a clinician. Like I don't work with kids. I don't work with kids, I work with parents. So I'm always, thinking through patterns from the parents angle and that's why these are like non-scientific they're just like if you're seeing this then you're probably going to be falling more into the category of x or y okay so i would think through these similar things of like does your child constantly want to do the same thing or do they constantly you know, you're asking, they, they want like a new toy, they play with it once and then they never want to see it again, which is like, could be typical toddler behavior. And this is why it's so hard to discern and why like, generally I say I work with families between the ages of three, children between the ages of three and 17. But I always prioritize the intuition of the parent. So like, if your intuition were telling you, and I've had clients who like their kid was two and a half and they were in my program and, and it was helpful, but like sometimes we don't know. And I'll just say I had that experience too, even though I think about this all the time, right? This is what I think about day and, day and night. There were periods when my son, William, and still on an occasional day where he was in his threes where I was like, is he PDA too? You know, because there are some behaviors that can be either. Um, I would look towards, you know, the able to play independently versus not independently. Like one of the key features of the experience of parents is like, you can't do anything else except be constantly providing undivided attention. Like, they don't play or engage with toys on their own. It has to be like you entertaining or improving for them, which is what on the extreme demand avoidance questionnaire, the previous one, question 26, is about, which is passive infancy, right? So there's this sense of like, you know, I used to be able to lay William on the floor when I was getting ready for work in D.C., and he would like play with a little like, toys that I would put above him and of course I had to touch base and watch him but I didn't have to be on the floor moving things for him or else he was screaming so those are things I would think about okay so Shannon what's the program and what's included okay so the program is my signature program it is called the paradigm shift program it is three months live and it is a cohort, so you're moving through the program with a group of like-minded families. So there are 85 pre-recorded short videos that are organized around what I call the 5A framework, which is awareness, deep understanding of your child's brain and nervous system, acceptance, radical acceptance of decision-making within constraints, third, accommodations. We walk through the 12 most effective accommodations. Nine of them are like respond, not responsive, proactive, like using humor, declarative language, co-regulation of the autonomic nervous system, like all the things we can do and implement to bring down our child's nervous system activation. And then I also walk through responsive accommodations, not reactive, <laughs> responsive, which is diffusion like diffusing that difficult behavior, de-escalation, and risk mitigation if your child is or teen is violent. Then we go on to 
module four, which is advo- not advocacy, affirmation, like developing a healthy self-concept for your child, building on the accommodations that we learned previously, and then finally advocacy or creating safe spaces for your family outside of the household. So that is the pre-recorded. There's PDFs that come with it and a members-only podcast where they're like five-minute episodes and answer all your questions. <laughs> they're recorded from previous Q&As from previous cohorts. And then we have um, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. New York time, I'll be with you guys to answer questions and spot coach specific parents who submit questions related to the modules. Um, There's an online community that will be moderated by two other parent coaches and lovely humans who one of whom is an alumni from the other paradigm shift program before this and is PDA identifying with four PDA kids and an expert in teens and complex cases. And then we will have guest experts. (laughs) So it's going to be a big bang for your buck. um, But the way I think about it is like to give you the absolute foundation to transform your life even if you don't process it all in the three months you have lifetime access so it's to empower parents to be able to transform their lives with their children and and establish stability but it's designed around teaching a long-term approach and helping with decision making so that is the program I welcome you to join the wait list we do have a very long wait list and we did sell out last time so if you're interested please join that it's in the link in my bio what is your number one advice you can come to the con- what is your number one advice you come to the conclusion your child is an autistic oh what's the number one advice you co- when you come to the conclusion your child is an autistic burnout you know I don't love giving out advice that's generic because I don't know anything about the case and like it's not always the same answer depending on who I'm talking to. Um, But I think the biggest piece of advice I have is like it's a long game, okay? So like you got to start thinking in long time horizons. Like I know it's really, really hard in the moment and like coming out of burnout can take a year But like all the decisions you make now, not to put pressure on you, but also to alleviate that pressure, like taking them out of school if they need to for a period or letting them have more screen time or not making them do chores or sitting at the table, like it feels like you're giving up, but you're actually bringing, you're you're acting in a way that will accommodate them and put them back in their thinking brain over time. Because remember, it's a cumulative So like what feels like bad parenting in the moment actually is what will facilitate them getting out of burnout. But we have to think long term, right? Like what we do now, even though it feels like your life is over, will actually set you up for more stability and peace a year or two from now. I mean, I will say the dividends of taking this approach are paying off really, really well for me after like three and a half years. Right. And so there is a period of trust that can feel like giving up. And I would say, like, just knowing that it's not going to be forever, but we do have to think long term of like, now is the time to allocate finances to you staying home potentially. Or now is the time, you know, it's like, I remember talking to my husband about like our emergency savings. and, And he said to me, he's like, Casey, this is an emergency right? Like this isn't like, this is what it's for. Right. But I just like, hadn't made that click of like, I was still trying to like solve the problem and like fix it with, with therapy and stuff. So PDA versus OGD, can it be a mix? Okay. So that question, so I wouldn't think of it as like, which is it in terms of the label? I would think of it as like, what works? Right? So if you're applying what they tell you to support ODD, which is like being stricter, behavioral approaches, you know, not letting them get away with it and things are getting worse, then I would encourage you to take a different path experimentally. Like just be honest with yourself. Is it working? Right? Is it is it helping? Is it helping your connection? Is it helping your kids' basic needs? Is it helping their meltdowns and fight flight? If it's not, 
then I encourage you to take some time to experiment with a different approach, collect data for yourself and make a decision. Because ultimately, like, like, unfortunately, in this historical moment, like, we have to decide as parents, like, nobody's going to be like, hey, I'm going to give you permission to do this. And hey, this is the right approach, because the evidence shows it in all the peer reviewed journal articles, because it doesn't yet. So you got to trust yourself. Oh, hello. When will the online community for the paradigm shift program open? Will it be before September? Okay, so the online community will open on September 6th, which is the day that the live cohort begins. When you purchase on the 9th, which is next Wednesday, you get access to all the pre-recorded videos, which is actually great because there's a lot and you can start to work through them and get your questions ready. And then you will have the online moderated community for three, three months. Yeah. Is dropping foods until down to four to six safe foods veer more towards PDA, autism, or both? Again, like I can't tell that just from that statement because like it could be autism and it could be a sensory experience, right? Could be PDA and it could be how we're delivering the foods, which makes it perceive, be perceived as a loss of autonomy and equality over and over. And then the kid's nervous system is like going into fight flight, which speeds up the metabolism, cortisol and adrenaline reduces hunger, like all the things. So I don't know, right? Like, that's why we have to sometimes choose a lane <laughs> or choose a lens and commit to it and observe the data with our own two eyes and and not doubt ourselves, like not listen to a doctor who is saying like, this should work because it's what the, the research shows. But if it's not working for your kid, then we got to take a different approach because the proof is in the pudding, right? Like, I'm sorry, it is common, but I can't tell you just from like this question, what the root cause might be. Like if we were in a coaching container, we would explore potential root causes with like an intake process and all of that. Um, if you're using an accommodation approach, low demand, etc., and over time your child starts to display more typically autistic behaviors when they didn't before. Yeah, that's very common for a couple of reasons. But the primary one is because their threat response isn't so activated and you can actually see what's behind the threat response for the first time. Second, if you're using an accommodation approach in low demands, you're signaling to them safety, so they're dropping the mask around you. And that means you see who they actually are behind the threat response. So like my son appeared much more autistic once we started um, using an accommodation approach and it was an uncomfortable transition as a parent right like the stimming the sounds like the flapping of the hands and it was like another layer of exploring my own difficulties and bias towards what I thought autism was right um but I don't think it's a bad sign like I don't think that's like you're not causing it <laughs> it's actually quite common um when kids when parents change their approach, right? Like the kid stops masking, they perceive safety. They may, um, they may also be temporarily more activated if we don't communicate with them. Like we're gonna be switching things up here because remember change, they have hypersensitive nervous system and neuroception. So they might be like, oh, there's a change, that's dangerous. Is there a discount for those who wish to repeat? Oh, Shannon for the paradigm shift program. Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, you're going to get access to everything except the live sessions and the expert sessions and the community. So why don't, if you want, you can email, um, as an alumni, you're going to get that all for free, but if you want to participate live, can you just go ahead and email us at journey at at peaceparents.com. Okay. Will your tools help with school? My six-year-old receives detention weekly for saying the F word or putting hands on teachers, scholars. We're hoping to improve this. So 
That's a complex question. So the tools can soften, like the tools work in accumulation. They're not in the moment solve the problem tools. The tools are part of an overall accommodation approach, which really requires consistency and a lifestyle change for many of us and advocacy within schools to apply those changes. But if your child is like way past the threshold of tolerance already, it will take time for them to come down. So this is not a quick fix of like apply this accommodation and then they stop doing the thing. It's like in accumulation and long term. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. So do you have any suggestions for helping my daughters who are anxious moments? Okay, that's a little outside of the scope of this live. Is your understanding that PDA is autism or can exist without autism? So I work through an identity lens. I'm not a clinician. But I'll tell you my perspective through a like more researcher lens and through a parent, coach, and mom lens. Through a researcher's lens, the patterns that I've seen are that the a large majority, most PDA children and teens are autistic. But not I don't know if that's true for all, right? But the reason I know that is because the social communication supports work to support them. When the parents accommodate, they notice that their child seems more autistic or the child identifies as, as autistic or teen. So that's like a pattern I've noticed, but I have spoken with evaluators and people who assess this question as clinicians. And I, ha I do know some who believe that most of the time it's autism, but they have seen some cases where it's not. On the other hand, and then the one th other thing I will say is that often parents resist the autism label, just like I did as a parent when my son started stimming more and I could see it more. Like it's, it happens. We're conditioned to think a certain way about autism. But parents resist that because it's too confronting for them. And so it feels a lot more comfortable to talk about things like ADHD highly sensitive child, anxiety, etc. SPD, 2E, gifted, right? And it doesn't matter. Like what matters is what helps your child, but that is a pattern I see. On the other hand, as a parent coach, like I don't care what your child's diagnoses and labels are at all. Like parents tell me, <laughs> my child is not autistic. And I'm like, awesome, they don't have to be. Like if you think it helps, that's what we're doing here. So I've also done surveys and worked with PDA identifying parents who do not identify as autistic. And I would never tell someone who identifies as PDA but not autistic that they're wrong. Like that's the whole point of an identity approach is that you get to choose, right? So like we have to parse. Are we talking about like the diagnostic statistical manual and categories that can be diagnosed in the medical system or are we talking about an identity lens which is autonomy you have autonomy to choose so i know there's a lot of feels about this in the online space but like i prioritize autonomy and respect for the individuality of each human and if they say that their identity is pda and not autistic i'm like okay great so that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. Is there help with explaining to siblings of the PDA or and how to help them coexist in the paradigm shift? Yes, we do talk about that. We do talk about that. Any clues, RE, internalized PDA versus trauma response that is also covered in the PSP. So I'm not gonna cover it here because we're running out of time. It's been almost an hour. Yeah, so these questions are getting outside of the scope of, the, oh, there's one. Are we allowed to share paradigm shift resources with spouse? He has been slow, reluctant, and too busy to get on the learning curve. PDA co-parenting is challenging. Absolutely. Okay, so first of all, I, I redesigned the paradigm shift program to help with this, like in the structure itself. 
So the reason I thought it was a good idea, not just for processing differences and the feedback I got from previous participants of like, there's so much to process, there's so much information, it can be hard to keep up. So I broke it down into 10 minute videos, right? The same content, but 10 minute videos that are standalone with captions and transcripts. So you can also take those and just be like, can you just watch this 10 minute video or strew a particular video for your partner that's not like a watch this two hour lecture, right? Secondly, each family gets two unique logins. So your partner can have the their own process <laughs> to go through this. Additionally, um, we talk about there's actually a, a bonus video about this specifically, but I'm enlisting my husband to do a session without me with mostly dads and non-lead parents to talk through this challenge of like not being the one who experiences all the trade-offs of not accommodating, but trusting a non-behavioral approach. So I'm trying to build in and do address this, but I don't necessarily take it head on. I strew it <laughs> and design it in a subtle way so like it has been helpful for a lot of my families where the dad did get on board or sorry I'm being gendered but I these are patterns of like the non-lead parent okay all right everybody I think I okay actually autistic Ashley says I have PDA profile and autism I gave my mom a lot of resources and I tried explaining to her what's going on in my brain body and she never follows through with anything. I'm so sorry that that's been your experience. Um, okay, so you are so welcome. It was awesome to have you guys here and I will see you guys soon. Okay, bye.